2022 paper one it is just essays no no mcq for this one and here is our first question hemostasis means arrest of bleeding what are the five factors that are involved in ensuring that hemostasis is realized in the body describe mechanisms by which these factors can fail to function so we can start there in case you have got any idea on the question just be free to open the mic and then you'll be able to answer so let's start with the first part of the question what are the five factors that are involved in ensuring that hemostasis is realized in the body anyone that can help us with anything that they have anyone what are the five factors that are involved in ensuring that the hemostasis is realized in the board Thank you so much. So basically that let, let's let's say this is our blood vessel and we've injured ourselves. Now because these are essays, we don't know what the next essay how it will come. So when we are I think when we are when we are answering one question, it would be better if we can also Try to talk about other possible things that they can ask. So here is our blood vessel. And so let's say there is an injury at this point. What is happening is that blood is flowing. So there are five things that will be able to happen. Number one, when I just injure myself, there's going to be vascular spasm, a contraction of the blood vessel. So vascular spasm and what is happening here remember blood is flowing out blood is coming out so you want to prevent at least to reduce the loss of blood so what happens is that blood vessels are surrounded by these smooth muscles so these smooth muscles that surround the blood vessels will be able to contract and when you contract you are reducing the space the lumen and when you are reducing the lumen at least you are reducing the amount of blood that is going to be flowing out there so what is going to be happening when this vascular spasm is happening number one there is going to be the release of what is known as endothe endothelin endothelin is being released by the smooth muscles and it's going to come and help in the contraction and then another thing this will actually be released by the injured blood vessel another thing that is going to be happening is that any injury that happens will cause the contraction of smooth muscles as a reflex mechanism so you have injured the blood vessel and what happens is there's going to be what is known as a myogenic myogenic uh, mechanism and this mechanism is just going to just that same injury to the blood vessel is going to be a factor enough to cause the smooth muscles to be able to contract and then the third thing that happens is that when there is an injury remember when there is an injury there is going to be the movement of the 
white blood cells and those are going to lead to inflammation and you know in inflammation there's going to be release of inflammatory mediators like the prostaglandins the leukotrienes and these inflammatory mod, mod, uh, modulators what they will do is that they are going to be able of course they are being released from nerves here you have got the nerves that will be picking up pain sensations, the nociceptors. So that is going to, the, the release of, of those inflammatory mediators are going to be able to stimulate the nociceptors and that is going to cause a pain reflex and just that pain reflex itself is going to be able to cause vascular spasm. So at least these three things will be responsible for the first thing that is happening, that is a vascular spasm. And then the second thing that is going to happen after your blood vessel has contracted, then you are going to form a platelet plug. So there's platelet plug formation. And this is actually known as a primary hemostasis. What is happening here? your blood vessel has been injured. Now, before I even go further to, to mention anything, let's see in case there's anyone that wants to help us in explaining about a platelet plank formation. How does it happen? Anyone that has got any idea to help us in describing the formation of a platelet plank? Let's be free doctors to contribute. No one wants to contribute. Okay, no, thank you so much for that. At least uh, it's been long, but data is still still somewhere, somewhere. Anyone else that can say anything that they remember on the formation of the platelet, platelet plug? Thank you so much. I think that, that that's a very good description. Uh, Doc Gretson, you also wanted to say something. All right. Thank you so much. So as the doc has said, just so that we can really see what is happening. So first thing, remember, there's an injury to our blood vessel. Now, blood vessels have got an epithelium and that epithelium is known as endothelium. 
and below the endothelium we have got what we call the sub endothelium so first thing is that there is an injury there is a discontinuity in endothelium so that disruption in endothelium is going to expose the sub endothelium which is here and that exposure of the sub endothelium is going to cause the endothelium is going to release the von so the endothelium is going to release what is known as a von Wilbrand factor. Okay, so that thing has been released. Now remember, we have exposed the subendothelium. The subendothelium is made up of connective tissue, things like collagen. So now that we have exposure of the von Willebrand factor and the collagen, this is going to attract platelets. So the first thing that is happening in platelet plank formation is platelet adhesion. So the platelets have come and they are adhering. And how are they doing that? So just on the same von Willebrand uh, factor, what is happening is that, let's say this is our blood vessel. We have got von Willebrand factor being produced by endothelium there. Our platelet, let's say this is a platelet. It has got a receptor. Specifically, that is going to be able to attach with the von Willebrand factor. And we call this as a glycoprotein 1B, GP1B. So this is known as adhesion. When adhesion happens, what is going to happen is that the platelets are going to be activated. And the platelets are going to start now releasing granules. The granules that they are releasing will include things like ADP, adenosine di the diphosphate. They are releasing thromboxane also. Specifically, thromboxane A2. They are also releasing the serotonin 5-HT. So after adhesion, the second thing that has happened is platelet activation, which is leading to the release of all these factors. What is happening is that ADP and thromboxane, these two guys, are going to be involved in chemotaxis. When they are released, they are going to go and bring other platelets. That is chemotaxis. And what is happening is that the same thromboxane with the serotonin are now going to be able to bind to the smooth muscles that we can see here. And these smooth muscles are going to further constrict or they are going to contract. And that leads to further vascular spasms and when that happens because the pla other platelets remember they've been brought by chemotaxis so let's see now what is going to happen those other platelets that have come in are going to bind with the other with the platelet that you are finding here and these guys have got receptors which they are going to use to bind to each other. And that is known as a glycoprotein 2B3A. We shouldn't forget this. So the third thing that is happening in the formation of a plant is a platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation is basically the platelets coming together. So that was the second thing that happens. And then the third, the third step that is going to happen, remember the platelet plank, this is a primary clot being formed or primary mostasis. Then there's going to be coagulation. And the coagulation, this is the secondary hemostasis. And we know now that we have got platelets are to bind here, so you have got now a lot of platelets where you have got an injury. I can remove this. So 
So there is our blood vessel and then there is our discontinuity or the injury. So a lot of platelets have come and they've attached here, a lot of them. So what we want to do is we want to strengthen this plug that has been laid by the platelets. So there's going to be now the coming in of a cascade, the intrinsic pathway. So the intrinsic pathway is activated just by the same injury that has happened here. The intrinsic pathway is activated just within the blood vessels themselves or within the blood itself. Let's say, for example, when you get blood, you put in a test tube that doesn't contain any anticoagulant. Blood itself will start clotting. The extrinsic pathway is because of the of a certain factor, which we call the tissue factor. So what is going to happen is because of the same injury, there's going to be the activation of factor 12. Factor 12 is activated to factor 12A. The factor 12A activates 11 to 11A. The 11A is going to activate 9 into 9A. A is representing activated. The 9 is going to activate 8 into 8A. And this guy, 8A, what it does is now, it is going to convert factor 10 into factor 10A. It doesn't do it alone. It is going to do it together with calcium and, the, and some other factors. There is what is known as platelet factor 3. So there is calcium here, which is factor 4, and the platelet factor 3. So these are going to convert factor 10 into factor 10A. When you have got factor 10A, this guy, what it's going to do is that it will activate the prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator is going to come and convert prothrombin, which is factor 2, into thrombin, which is factor 2A. This thrombin, which is factor 2A, is going to convert factor 1, which is fibrinogen, into factor 1A, which is fibrin. And this fibrin is what is going to come and form a mesh. So it will now come and form a mesh here. We could have, add, so this is the intrinsic pathway. We could have also at the extrinsic where you have got it. tissue injury is going to cause the release of factor 3, which is known as tissue activator. I mean tissue factor. This factor 3 is going to lead to the, con the conversion of factor 7 into 7A. And then this 7A will now come back to this, to the step where it can convert factor 10 into 10A there. So the time it takes for the plate, uh, for the extrinsic pathway, that's known as the intrinsic because it's long. That's known as PTT. And this time is much longer because you can see it is a longer step, isn't it? It takes about 28 to 35 seconds. The extrinsic pathway is really short. The time there is known as the prothrombin time, and it's very short. It just takes around 11 to 13 seconds. So when you are measuring the PT, the, plasma, uh, the prothrombin time, you are basically measuring the activity of factor 3, factor 7 and also these factors that are present in the common pathway and then for ptt it is going to be the intrinsic factors so this is the coagulation part and then phase 4 that our doc already did mention is going to be now when you are formed your clot. The clot has to be strong so that blood is is not constantly. We've already formed the fibrin that we're going to put on top and then the, the clot is strong. So step four is going to be what is known as clotting retraction. 
and repair. And what is happening here is that when we have formed our clot, remember we had a break in the endothelium. Here is our break. So what is happening is that the platelets, since they are now here where there is this break, the platelets are going to start contracting. And when they contract, they are simply trying to bring these two walls that have broken together, close together. Number four is clot, uh, clotting, retraction, and repair. Yes. So what is happening is that number one, the platelets, there is platelet contraction. And in platelet contraction, you are basically trying to bring the endothelium, the walls of the endothelium together. Number two, there's going to be uh, the release of what is known as platelet-derived growth factor. Platelet-derived growth factor. And this guy, what he's going to do is, because we remember we said we have got smooth muscles here, so it's going to go there in case there was injury to the smooth muscles in the subendothelium. There's going to be mitosis happening. So it will cause mitosis. The platelet derived growth factor it is going to cause mitosis and also the repair of the connective tissue. There's another thing that is going to be released. Oh, I'm writing this under another. Uh, there's another thing that is going to be released besides uh, the platelet derived growth factor platelet derived growth factor another thing that is being released is known as a vascular endothelial growth factor so what this guy is doing is that because there's a break in endothelium is just coming to fix that that destroyed endothelium and then the last step is now going to be what is known as fibrinolysis. Because if you don't break the clot that has formed, the clot is forming and forming. Can you say that it can end up obstructing our blood vessel? And that is going to lead to thrombosis. In case this clot dislodges and starts moving in the blood vessel, that is known as an embolism. And it can cause problems. Imagine it goes to the brain. It can lead to a stroke. So we want to break down this clot. And what is going to happen? What are, the, what are the things that can be involved in the breakdown of a clot? You have got what is known as plasminogen. Plasminogen can be converted to plasmin. Plasmin digests the fibrin that was holding this guy but then how can we convert fibrin plasminogen to plasmin we can use remember when you are talking about uh, bacteria strep strep biogenes those guys they, they produce what is known as a streptokinase so streptokinase is also known as a tissue plasminogen Tissue plasma uh, plasma plasminogen activator plasma. Well, it has gone again. The tissue plasma activator. Let's hope it's not plasminogen plasma or plasminogen. We are activating plasminogen, so that's supposed to be plasminogen, isn't it? Activator. So what is happening is that this guy is converting the plasminogen to plasmin. It's also known as a streptokinase. We also have urokinase like a plasminogen activator, UPA. It can as well convert the plasminogen to plasmin, including also factor 12. It can as well convert plasminogen to plasmin, and then the plasmin will be able to break down the, the fibrin. But when you are breaking down the fibrin, there's one important thing that is produced. So there are things which are produced known as the fibrin split products because you are breaking down the fibrin. Fibrin split products. You are going to see them abbreviated as FSP. And the common one that is going to pro be produced is known as the D-dimer. 
So in blood, this guy is very important. Use diagnostically in blood. When you see D dimer in blood, it means that you act there was a condition of where blood was clotting. What are examples that we can give? For example, disseminated intravascular coagulation. For example, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary thromboembolism. So all those might be the conditions that you can diagnose if you see D-dimer in blood. So these are the five things that we can mention here five factors and then the second part of the question is saying describe mechanisms by which these factors can fail to function so now that we understand these what can make them fail to function will be easy we can simply start by looking at each one of them and look at what can affect them so that they don't function well let me pose the question anything that you think can uh, make these factors to fail to function you can pick anyone that you can mention and then what you think can make it to fail to function. For example, vascular spasm, what do you think can make it fail to function and the others? Yes, Doc, there's a hand. Thank you so much. That, that is true. The platelet plank formation, you don't have enough platelets. Let's say even the same thrombo, yeah, the thrombocytopenia, you have got reduced platelets. So what happens in that case, you'll not be able to form the clot property. And you know the effect of that, there's going to be excessive bleeding. Anyone that can pick up another one? And you can think of, remember we're describing mechanisms, so you can think of things that can lead to the reduction in the platelet count. Anyone that can mention even just one, anything that can lead to a reduction in the platelet count. Yes, please. The deficiency of vitamin K, thank you so much. Specifically, that is going to lead to a decrease in the clotting factors. And for vitamin K, there are specific clotting factors that it stimulates the production for. We need to know them. I think even in test one, they brought them, if I'm not mistaken. Anyone who can help us with those clotting factors that are going to be affected if you don't have vitamin K or there is a deficiency of vitamin K. Thank you so much. Basically that, two, seven, nine, and 10. All right, so we have talked about the, re the reduction of platelets and also vitamin K deficiency. Those are going to lead to failure or formation of a platelet plug. Anything else that someone can pick here? Anything? How about just things that affect coagulation? The coagulation itself. Do you know anyone that can mention anything that hinders proper coagulation, the proper blood, or the cascade, like the intrinsic pathway, any condition? There is a condition that specifically affects factor eight and factor nine. Anyone who knows the name of the condition and is classified as A and B? Yes, please. Thank you so much, hemophilia. Thank you so much for that. Any other condition that we can think of affecting any one of these? The von Willebrand disease also. Thank you so much. What will be the effect? All right. Thank you so much. 
So when someone has got a disease, it means that you might not be able to have the aggregation or the adhesion of the platelets, and so you can't form the plug. We have got still more. Anything else? So that when it comes again, at least if we've mentioned a lot, someone can remember some. Thank you so much. Disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Would you say something about the condition? What would be the mechanism by which they are, uh, it, that is leading to it? Looking at these factors, what would be the dysfunction? Let's be free to contribute. We still have more, a lot of things that we can talk about. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you so much for that one. So when you are describing a factor, at least know where you are describing the factor. Which point? Is it the vascular spasm, the platelet plug, and where else? Just like that. Okay, another thing that we can think of when you're talking about coagulation, let's say, for example, medications like uh, those anticoagulant medications, heparins, warfarins, they're also going to affect uh, the function here, the, the clotting. Besides that, when you're talking about clot retraction and repair, remember the basic thing that we're talking about there is you're trying to restore what has been destroyed. So let's say, for example, someone has got hypofibrogenemia, like you have got little fibrin. So even when you're trying to bring back these guys, because you have got little fibrin, you'll not be able to hold the endothelium together like that. So that is going to be affected. We can as well for, for the first vascular spasms, you want your blood vessel to contract, but let's say someone has got hypertension. So there is a lot of, the blood flow is very high. Even when you're trying to contract the blood vessel, think of a horse pipe where you have got a hole somewhere and then the pressure is high. So when you are trying to tie that hole because of the high pressure, the pressure is counteracting your efforts. So those are some things that can get to affect. I think we've talked a bit about this question. Unless there's someone that wants to add something or ask anything on this part before we move out. I bet it's good. Question two. Dif discuss anemias under the following headings. In each case, give appropriate examples. The definition and the etiological classification. Remember, this is specific to etiological classification. Anemias can be classified in a lot of ways, but this is specifically etiological. Let's start with definition. Anyone to help us with the definition for anemia? A nice definition, pathological. <laughs> anyway, the definition is a definition. Anyone? Please go on.
thank you so much as direct as that so in definition we can have reduced total total amount of red blood cells or we can be talking about reduction in hemoglobin and because of the reduction of hemoglobin or the total number of red blood cells there is a reduction in oxygen delivery to tissue and you know that if there is no enough oxygen delivery to tissue that is hypoxia and then let's go to the etiological classification what how can we classify anemias based on their causes uh okay so anemia is a condition in which there is reduction in the total amount of red blood cells or reduction in hemoglobin which reduces oxygen delivery to tissue that's fine so we can now go to the etiological classification how can we classify anemias based on what causes it yes doc Thank you so much. Basically that. So these are the basic classification. Remember the first thing we said, the definition of anemia, there is a reduction in the amount of red blood cells or hemoglobin so what can lead to the reduction you can either be having a blood loss or increased destruction of the red blood cells or you are not making enough so let's start with the blood loss as our doctor said blood loss can either be acute or chronic so we can split this into acute or chronic now when you are talking about acute blood loss it's a blood loss that is happening within a short period of time it happens and when you're talking about this one what can lead to that sudden loss in blood there are different things you can have external forces or internal forces and when you're talking about external forces that can lead to sudden loss of blood let's say trauma is a common one let's say someone has been involved in a road traffic accident or you someone is in surgery and then for whatever mistake maybe they missed the the blood vessel ended up cutting it and then blood is flowing like that so that can lead to anemia due to blood loss and it is acute because it is sudden and it's because of external factor internal factors that are acute that can lead to blood loss can include things like gi ulceration you have got an ulcer in the git and that leads to blood loss when we go to the chronic classification it is also the same we can the chronic classification chronic is just meaning 
you are losing blood gradually over a long period of time. It can as well be due to external factors or internal factors. So external factors that can cause the loss of blood chronically over a long period of time can include things like uh, blood disorders, say for example, hemophilia. You don't have blood clotting factors, so you'll be losing blood. And that you not lose these clotting factors just overnight. It might be a chronic condition that has made you lose that. And then we can also have the chronic condition due to internal forces, for example, just inside, you have got a chronic gastric ulcer. It has been there for long, different from the GI ulceration that has been there. It's not been there for long. So that is on the blood loss. And then when we come to when we come to the destruction. What is going to be leading to the destruction of red blood cells? We can have different things. We can have intrinsic factors. So intrinsic factors that are leading to the destruction of the red blood cells, we as well call this as intravascular hemolysis because it's happening within the blood vessel. We can as well have extrinsic factors. And this is because of different agents. They are not part of our body. They are the ones that are coming to destroy our blood cells. Let's start with the intrinsic. So intrinsic factors or intravascular hemolysis can be because of congenital genetic defects. You are born like that. And so the this is basically affecting the structure of the red blood cells. For example, someone that has got what we call Hereditary spherocytosis. Spherocytosis, specifically because of a problem in a protein known as a spectrine. You can also have ovulocytosis, erythrocytosis. Basically, there is that change in shape, the shape of the red blood cells. You can talk about sickle cell disease, where the shape of the red blood cells is not fine. So those fact, all those can lead to intrinsic destruction of the red blood cells. How is that happening? Because when the red blood cells are flowing in the blood vessels, the capillaries which are small not be able to allow them to pass and so they end up being destroyed. When we come to the extrinsic mechanisms, Red blood cells are being destroyed not because of their problem in shape. It's because of some other factors which are external. This can include infections. We know of a common malaria as a common infection. And we know what happens. Besides that, even the actual treatment for malaria, like when you are using quinine, quinines also lead to anemia. Even the malaria itself leads to anemia. So when you are treating someone with the quinines, you will not know if they if they have got anemia, whether the problem is because of the plasmodium parasite or is because of the treatment. Another thing, it can be physical agents. Physical agents can as well lead to the destruction of the red blood cells. For example, we are talking about heat. This can lead to the destruction of the red blood cells. And then when we are talking about the defective blood formation here what we can refer what what we can talk about can be what is leading to defective blood formation maybe you don't have enough building blocks for the blood for the red blood cells for example you don't have enough nutrients that are needed so you have got nutritional anemias for example you lack folate you lack vitamin B12, you lack iron. So all those conditions can lead to defective blood formation. And besides that, you can also have 
not nutritional, but let's say there's an interference or a disturbance with bone marrow. So this is also going to disturb the production of red blood cells, including other blood cells. But then what can lead to this interference in the bone marrow? For example, let's say, for example, toxic agents, like someone is exposed to radiations, x-rays, even CFD, someone has got triponema pallidum. We know that there is a toxin produced by, C by triponema pallidum, which is known as hemolysin. That is going to cause a disturbance in the production. There's going to be defective production of the red blood cells. Besides the toxic agents, you can also have severe infection. Severe infection, for example, renal disease. Why is renal disease very important? Because the kidney is where erythropoietin is produced. So if, erythrop if you have got a disease of the kidney, erythropoietin production is disturbed and that is going to end up ending up producing defective blood cells. Besides that, even the bone marrow can be substituted. Instead of you having the normal hematopoietic cells, you end up having fibrosis. So that substitution can as well lead to defective production of red blood cells. So this is how we can classify anemias on the etiology. Etiology is not the only way we can classify anemias. We can also classify them in what we call cytometric. Let me just mention this and then we'll be able to go and study them. Cytom we also have the cytometric cl classification. This one depends on the MCV. This is where you are looking at the, are you having microcytic or normocytic or macrocytic anemias and those things. As well, you can classify anemias depending on erythrokinetic. So erythrokinetic classification. And besides that, you can also classify them depending on the biochemical nature. So the erythrokinetic, this is where I'm basically talking about the rate of red blood cell destruction. So because the red blood cells are being destroyed, the bone marrow is also trying to compensate. So I'm going to be able to see an increase in the number of reticulocytes, the immature red blood cells. And then the biochemical classification, this is just designed to recognize and identify depletion of cofactors. For example, iron is depleted in iron deficiency anemia. And any depleted cofactor can cause certain type of anemia, like megaloblastic anemia because of vitamin B12 and folate. That's a biochemical. Is there any other addition? or question on this before we go to the next question. Okay, believe that's okay. We have got this nice question here. A 19 year old male presents with two month history of weakness, fatigue, intermittent fever, I want us to be taking note of these ones, these things. Weakness, there is fever, uh, sorry, fatigue, and then intermittent fever. And I want us to start thinking about what can cause them. Even epistaxis, uh, he was previously well with no history of illness. On examination, he is pale, few brow, the temperature you can see is elevated. And then there is mild hepatosplenomegaly. And we can think of what what a kidney, we know what the, the spleen does to the red blood cells, right? And also there is gut hypertrophy. So we can as well be thinking of that. Full blood count shows the total white blood cell. 1.5 times 10 to the power 9. The normal is 4 to 10, so you can see that's less. Hemoglobin is 4.2. The normal is 
to 17, that's less. Platelets is 24, the normal is 150, that's also less. Give an interpretation of the full blood count results. What would be the interpretation? Looking at the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and also the the platelets. Now, of course, red blood cells is being represented by hemoglobin. What would be our interpretation of the full blood count? Anyone? Let's first look at the white blood cells. What would be our interpretation? We look also at hemoglobin. What would be the interpretation? We also look at the platelets. What would be the interpretation? So there is a decrease, yes. And then for the for hemoglobin. is also decrease and then for the platelets pardon how about the platelets Yes, please. Okay, so give an interpretation. Imagine they asked this question. What would you talk about in interpretation? Thank you so much. Or we could have just mentioned the basic things, isn't it? There's a decrease in blood, decrease in that. So, look, opinion for the white blood cells. We have got anemia because of hemoglobin being reduced. Thrombocytopenia because of the platelets. What term is used to describe the total white cell count in this patient? Total white cell count in this patient. What would we say? Pardon? So specifically this one is white cell count. So it's leukopenia. Thank you. Because all the red, all the types of cells are reduced, that is pancytopenia. But since they have asked for white blood cells, that's leukopenia. Give two causes of low total white cell count. What can cause reduction in the white blood cell count? Bone marrow failure. Any 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 cause that can cause bone marrow failure? A plastic anemia. Right. Thank you so much. Leukopenia. Question three. So question three, give two causes. Okay, that's the one that we are still answering. So one thing that has been given, give two causes of low white blood cell count. It is bone marrow failure. And one of our docs has mentioned to say, what can cause bone marrow failure? You can have aplastic anemia. Anyone to discover what's aplastic anemia? What's a plastic anemia? Anyone? Let's participate, guys.
Okay, we have given one possible cause for the reduction in the red blood cells. Any other cause, anything that else that we think can lead to the reduction in the number of white blood cells? Leukemia, cancer of the, of the white blood cells, all right? Anything else besides that we can mention as much as we can? Okay, a plastic anemia is a, is a condition in which there is failure of production of the blood cells by the bone marrow. So there, there is a problem in the bone marrow. And so all the blood cell production have been reduced. There is low red blood cells leading to anemia, low white blood cells leading to to leukopenia, low platelets leading to thrombocytopenia. And then any other cause, any other thing that can lead to a reduction in white blood cells? Remember for pancytopenia, so what can cause pancytopenia? A plus, yes, basically the same thing, isn't it? But when when we are forming all blood cells, the production of blood cells also requires, remember the nutrients. So from that idea, what other thing can cause a reduction in the number of white blood cells? Yeah, including also infections, like the viral infections. Anything else? Even medications, for example, chemo. You know chemo is going to come and you are destroying basically everything. And so it will not spare the bone marrow and that can lead to the reduction. Even some other drugs like uh, antibiotics, you also have drugs that reduce the effect of the your immune system, which is basically the white blood cells, like the uh, immunosuppressants. So there are a lot of others, even systemic infections, autoimmune disorders, for example, lupus. Arthra uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So all those conditions, deficiency of blood, of uh, of nutrients like iron, copper, because those guys are so involved in the making of red blood. I mean the blood cells. You can as well be having exposure to to radiations. These are also able to affect. What could the explanation B for the intermittent fever in this patient. What do we think? Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much. That's one that we can give. But I believe there's no one one road to somewhere, isn't it? They they can maybe someone is thinking of another thing that they have seen from the scenario. Anyone else? Look at this patient. This patient has got the mild hepatosplenomegaly. What do we think is going to be happening to the red blood cells? Or oh, let me ask a simple question. What causes fever in malaria? Anyone that can help us with that?
Yes, basically that. So the destruction of the red blood cells, as we can see, there is a reduction in hemoglobin. Or hemoglobin is found in the red blood cells. Obviously, for it to be low, we're expecting that the red blood cells are being destroyed, looking even at the spleen being big. So also the destruction of the red blood cells. We can do the next question. What could explain epistaxis? Epistaxis is bleeding in the nose. Why do we think this patient is bleeding? He is susceptible to bleeding. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Basically that there is a reduction, remember th thrombocytopenia. And it means that for a slightest thing, you are not having any any clothes. And then the second part of the question, a bone marrow aspiration, BMA, and trepin biopsy. So this trepin biopsy is just a method that is used for you to get like a sample from bone marrow so that you look at it using this um, trepin. So these two guys are performed, the bone marrow aspiration, markedly hypercellular with the predominance of intermediate to large cells. So take note of that. With moderate cytoplasm, with granules and hoa rods. This is specific. This guy is a specific. It's a specific indication for something. Okay, so let's take note of that. Nuclear of variable morphology with fine chromatin and the pre prominent nucleoli. The trepin biopsy shows the same feature. These cells express CD34, CD13, 33, 117. These guys are also specific to a certain condition and are negative for TDT. What could explain the gum hypertrophy in this patient? Why do you think there will be gum hypertrophy in this patient? Anyone? All right, thank you so much. So the leukocytes are infiltrating the gum, right? And that is what can lead to, hyper, to hypertrophy. And then what is the nature of the cells described in the bone marrow aspiration report? Just the nature. Look at this, the cells are hypercellular, they are large with moderate cytoplasm. What is the nature of these cells? Looking at those descriptions. Are these mature cells? If they are mature, what do we call them? If they are not mature, what do we call them? Thank you so much. So these are, yes, immature cells. These are blast cells, the myeloblasts. Okay, we can do the next. What is the definitive diagnosis? So our dog gave us a definitive diagnosis. One thing that you use 
we said it is acute uh, myeloid leukemia. How did we tell specifically these you your roads and this CD34, CD13, CD33, CD117, these are specific to the condition. They are specific. So if it was, remember this is myeloid. If it was a lymphoid leukemia, lymphoid leukemia, remember the lymphoid progenitor cells, you have got two many types of cells that come from there. You actually have what we call the large lymphocytes and the small lymphocytes. The large lymphocytes are the natural killer cells and we are not interested in them. The small lymphocytes who have got T cells and B cells. So the marker of the T cells and the B cells, you are going to have specifically, the, the first, all the cells, the stem cells have got one marker like they can all be marked by CD34. Now to be to be specific, when you are now going to the myeloid, acute myeloid, leukemia, and the lymphoid, the myeloid is the TDT negative, while the lymphoid is going to be positive for TDT. And then from lymphoid you want to differentiate whether this lymphoid leukemia is affecting the t cells or the b cells the t cells the markers you are going to see them they have got a single digit cd2 cd3 cd7 single digits for the b cells they are going to have double digits CD10, CD19, CD22. We should take note of these markers because especially these are the ones they concentrated when they were teaching this topic. So should be able to, to mention them. Okay. What further investigations would you require beyond what has already been provided? You want to do more so that it is just more confirmatory of an acute myeloid leukemia. What further investigations are we able to perform? Anyone? All right, so for these diseases, the, like the leukemia, you have seen you have got a cancer of the myeloid cells. Besides you looking at the CD34 and these UR roads, you can do a cytogenetic analysis. Here you are basically trying to look at what is the genetic abnormality. And there is a specific genetic abnormality that we are going to be able to see for people that have got this acute myeloid leukemia. Yeah, it is specific. And then besides that, we can as well get to look at uh, molecular studies. So for molecular studies, you want to basically identify the specific genetic mutation that is there. So there are some mutations that are associated. So we remember we've said cytogenic is also the molecular. There are specific mutations involved with the acute myeloid leukemia. Like you are going to see mutations like ASX, L1, but those we can lead them. But those are investigations we can perform, cyto, Genetic analysis, looking at the chromosome, what is the abnormality, which chromosome, and then the molecular studies now to identify the specific gene on the chromosome. What are the treatment options for your diagnosis? If you find someone has got acute myeloid leukemia, what are the treatment options that you can that can be available? Anyone?
Thank you so much. That, that, that is one way that we can take. We can go by chemo because remember this is a cancer, so you want to to remove the cancer cells. Any anything else? Any available treatment that we can get to offer? So another thing that we can do generally, you want to support the patient. So there is general support therapy where you just want to prevent tumor lysis syndrome. You as well want to maintain the platelet count at least to be in the normal range. Because normally when you have got this condition, you can see that it's also affecting the platelets. Because someone has got also a fever, you want also to treat that fever. So the aim of treatment when it comes to acute myeloid leukemia is to induce complete remission so that you remain at least with less than 5% of those immature cells. And you want also maybe to consolidate intensive therapy and eliminate the disease. So besides the supportive therapy, we have said you can as you get to put someone on chemo. There's also stem cell transplant because you've seen that the, there is an effect. The cells that you have are not okay. So you can transplant, you put a stem cell so that they start now producing good cells. So that is another thing that we're able to do. Is there any question before we go to the next? Okay. Fill in a table to show the difference fit uh, the different shading features between benign and malignant neoplasm. So want to put a feature and then what it is for benign and malignant. For this one, we can have even at least, anyway, let's start anyone to give us one feature and then how it will show in malignancy and benign tumors. And rate of growth, yes. So, so how is the rate of growth for benign and malignant tumors? Okay, so in benign tumors, the tumors are slowly growing, while for malignant, they are rapid. There is a lot of mitosis here. Yes, please. Anyone else? There's also tissue invasion. Yes. So they thank you so much. So benign, there is no for the malignant. Yes. Any other? Any other? metastasis yes so for this one what happens okay so there is metastasis in malignancy and not in benign any other feature
Oh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So differentiation, which one is well differentiated? So the benign are well differentiated. And then these ones are poorly differentiated. So when you look at uh, on differentiation, the malignant cells look abnormal. You can tell this is not the way an epithelial cell is supposed to look. But for the benign cells, they will look just normal, like the normal cell in that region. Any other feature besides this that we can mention? Pardon? Repeat on which one? Okay, so for metastasis, let's say here, here is our our board. Here is our diaphragm. The cancer is here. So it can move from this point, it will go throughout the board, that is to metastasize. Tissue invasion is this cancer being able to go to other tissues. So it is at this point, but it can move from this point and then go to other tissues or the surrounding tissue. Let's say this surrounding tissue like that. It can penetrate. So let me make it bigger because that is going to give us another difference. So this is our cancer cell. And this is our surrounding tissue. So for the, for the malignant guy, it can go there, it can invade, to invade is to penetrate. But then for a benign tumor, it will not be able to penetrate. Instead, that will lead us to another point known as encapsulation, encapsulation right? So for, for the encapsulation, that is same with the same invasion. When you look at uh, benign tumors, they end up forming a capsule because when they are pressing on the tissue that is next to them, they will just be pressing on the tissue. And so the tissue they are pressing on, on ends up more like forming a capsule around them. So the benign tumors, they are going to show encapsulation. They are, the tissue in which they were supposed to invade they can't invade it, so it ends up more like surrounding the tumor cell. But for malignant cells, they don't form this capsule. Instead, they are going to invade the tissue. Instead of forming a capsule, they'll end up tearing through, and then they'll go there. They'll not form a capsule. Hope that makes sense. So the malignant guys are non-invading, so they can't form a capsule. Any other feature? Okay, so thank you so much. Benign cells, you will not differentiate them from the... That is more like similar to differentiation. The, the shape is the same 
the structure is the same as our normal tissue. For malignant guys, the shapes are different. You can't, you can easily differentiate them from normal tissue. Okay. So I think we've mentioned a lot of things there. There is also recurrence. After you treat, what happens? There is another addition. Please, you can go on. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. So put also pleomorphism there. So pleomorphism, as the, the doc has said, you are comparing the tumor cells themselves. Are they looking the same? So for benign, for benign tumors, the cells comparing themselves, they are going to be looking the same. For malignant tumors, you see some one is like that, one is like that, one is like that. They have got different shapes and sizes. Okay. So as I was saying, there's also recurrence. Often after treatment, the benign tumors, okay, let's talk about prognosis. They are generally good. You cannot, after surgery, when you remove them, you would have treated the condition, but that's not the case with eh? malignant tumors. They require extensive treatment. Another thing that we can talk about is effect on the surrounding tissue. Malignant cells will be able to invade and destroy the surrounding tissue while benign cells just compress the surrounding tissue, they don't destroy, they don't invade. I think those are a lot. We can answer the next question here. List the laboratory methods with example for the diagnosis of cancer. Anyone to help us with any? Laboratory method with an example for cancer diagnosis. Anyone? Pardon? Tissue biopsy, an example. That one is what, anyway, you, you can give uh, what you are thinking and then we can, we can now. Okay, an example, breast cancer where you get a biopsy. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Yes. 
any other method? We can start. Who wants to start? Also, tumor markers. Yes, tumor markers. An example. Actually, molecular is another method. So we have got hepatopathological, where, so, sorry, not hepato, histopathological, the histology. That's where we can get a biopsy. Are going to look at that in a microscope. Histo pathological exam. And then we have got the cytological exam where we're getting a pap smear. So where we're getting a pap smear and then that pap smear, for example, for for cervical cancer, right? You know how we get the pap smear and then we go and use the microscope. We can as well use the molecular diagnosis. An example we can use is PCR, polymerase chain reaction, tumor markers. There are a lot of tumor markers. For example, I've got the cancer 125, CA125 for ovarian cancer. There's also PCA, PSA for prostate cancer. That is, those are tumor markers. So those are some methods that we are able to use. At least let's know of histopathological. I can get a biopsy, cytopathological, or cytology, where we can you get a pap smear for the cells, specifically cytology, molecular PCR tumor markers. Is there another addition or question before we move from this one? Mm, I'm wondering if that is a uh, laboratory. Yes. Okay, I think for today we can end on this question. Our two hours will be done by then. The following questions are based on this clinical scenario. Jane Mwanza is a 60 year old woman who presented to the hospital with complaint of a lump in the left breast. The lump is not freely movable. She had menac at 10 years of age and menopause at 55. Wow. I can already see. She has no history of hormone replacement therapy. Pathologist diagnoses the lump as an invasive ductal carcinoma of low grade. Describe the triple test or triple assessment for breast cancer. You can start there. What makes up the triple assessment? Number one. Okay, we have got the clinical and assessment and imaging. And then the third one. There is a biopsy. Thank you. So the clinical, this is where you're having, you are taking history and also performing a physical exam, palpating the breast from the nipple round. Imaging, you can do two things. You can do a mammal 
a mammal at mammal graph and an ultrasound but then you need to so which one when do you do which one anyone to help with that one when do you perform a mammogram and then a, uh, an ultrasound yes please Okay, so mammogram is for, for those above 35. Anyone else? Or who wants to say the same? Anyone else? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so ultrasound you are using in the young, isn't it? mammogram in the old so from where is the doc who taught the topic i think he mentioned uh, 40 years from the clinical skills where they mentioned 35 so just somewhere there mammogram above and then the other one below for a biopsy specifically what what biopsy are we getting here yes the fine needle aspiration okay and then number two what is the most likely molecular profile of jane's cancer molecular profile so this woman has got invasive ductal carcinoma of low grade what would be the most likely molecular profile So molecular, yes, please. Lumino A. Okay, so for, for people to be able to get that, we need to answer the second, the next question. What is the molecular classification of breast cancer? Anyone that can help us with this one, how do we classify breast cancer? by the molecular classification uh, i want us to come back to this one so it is the lumino a but then for us to understand it we need to understand the third question so here is supposed to be lumino a so anyone to help with the part three, what is the molecular classification of breast cancer? Yes, please. Mm.
All right. Thank you so much. Hope we have gotten that. Just so that we can see on the screen, Lumino A, Lumino B has two enriched basal like also known as triple negative. What you are looking at are the hormones. Lumino A, here the cancer will be responding to estrogen and progesterone. So we say it is estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, but it doesn't respond to what is known as the HAR receptor, HAR2. So it do not respond to this, so it is negative to this HAR. This cancer, because it is positive for it, it can respond to the estrogen and progesterone meaning that the treatment you can use these hormones so that's why this guy is low grade okay because it's not that bad you can actually treat with those simple things for lumino b it is also er positive pr positive it can either be positive for the this gene or it can be negative either positive or negative this one is intermediate grade or moderate and then for the high enriched this guy it is negative for these two er negative and pr negative but as from the name har2 enriched it is H E R two positive. The basal like even from the name, it is a triple negative. It's a triple negative, meaning that it is negative for all. So it is E R negative, P R negative, and also H E R two negative. As you can see, it is basal like. So meaning that you're supposed to have basal, but specifically these are the ones that you use. Okay. So from the question, what have we been told? The lamp is not free. She had the menopause. She has no history of that. The pathology diagnosis was an invasive ductocarcinoma. They've already told us low grade because you have got T low grade being lumino a and then moderate is lumino b and then you have got high grade being has and also the triple negative and then number four what is the importance of testing breast cancer for estrogen receptors anyone Thank you so much. So that's a basic thing for the sake of uh, treatment. Like the guys which are ER and PR positive. These guys indicate cancers which grow in response to these hormones like the estrogen and the progesterone. So you can basically use the hormone therapy in their treatment. And then for the HAR2 positive is a cancer that has got more receptor for, for the HAR2. So meaning that that one, you can use the hormone therapy, the, the target therapy for that same receptor. 
So you need to know this classification because it's going to help in what receptor you are going to be targeting. Basically that. And then number five, occasionally breast cancers are hereditary. Mention a genetic problem that predisposes to cancer, which reportedly affected one famous Hollywood movie star. Question four, it is uh, one advantage is for treatment options and for prognosis. So if you know which receptor are present for that cancer to help in the treatment options and also it will show us how good the prognosis is going to be for, for each type of treatment. Sure. Occasionally, breast cancers are hereditary. Mention a genetic problem that predisposes to cancer, which reportedly affected one famous Hollywood movie star. Anyone? Sure. Would you say that again? Or mutation. Okay, thank you. Mutations. So, yeah, that is true. So, let's say someone is to have a mutation. Mm. Where they, they should be, let's say there is someone, you have got two women. Like here, the way they've mentioned the famous... Hollywood movie star or, or had a certain genetic problem. So there's a certain genetic problem that will make some women to be more susceptible or prone to getting the cancer than other women. That there's a specific gene that is actually responsible for for those mu mutations that can happen. Anyone that can mention it? Thank you. So BRCA1 and BRCA2. So those who have got, women that have got this gene have got a high risk for getting breast cancer. The famous uh, movie star they are talking about here, in case you've watched, Angelina Jolie. Not all breast lumps are malignant. Describe the morphology of a breast lump that typically affects young girls and young women. Not all of them are malignant. So which 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 breast lump morphology normally affects the young women? Because in this question, what has been mentioned is a non-freely movable. And you can see this woman started earlier menses and she finished late. So she had a longer period with men uh estrogen the more exposed you are to estrogen the more likely you are to get breast cancer so let's say i've got a woman that started a, a period at 15 she finished at 45 so a fatal period is 30 years and in these 30 years you know estrogen is being produced and let's say you have got another person who started at 10, they finished at 55. So the fatal period for this woman is actually 45. So in 45 years, they are producing estrogen. So this second one is more likely to have cancer. Now, if a woman is pregnant, that time when she's pregnant, estrogen is suppressed. You are producing more of the progesterone. 
So because there's a reduction in the production of estrogen during pregnancy and actually also during breastfeeding. So being pregnant or breastfeeding reduces the risk of getting breast cancer. Okay, so, but we are not saying we're going to. So not all breast lumps are malignant. Describe the morphology of breast lump that typically affects young girls and young women. Anyone who can try this one? Thank you. They are mobile, they are oval, they are well circumscribed. Yes. So define shape or well circumscribed. So the common ones actually known as fibroadenoma. So basically that is that. And for today, here is where we end.